Hi, I'm George Vranos. In this program, we're going to demonstrate a series of very effective and very practical compliance techniques. The purpose of this program is not to teach many techniques, but as few techniques as possible. The fewer techniques an officer has to learn, the more effective he will become in the street. If we apply the same techniques over and over again, the movements will become natural and reflexive, and pretty soon, our police work will become our practice. Thank you. I hope you enjoy this video program. In this tape, we will be attacking six nerve targets. We attack these nerves for three specific reasons. Number one, to off-balance the subject. Number two, to gain compliance through pain. And number three, to weaken muscle groups. I would like to introduce Todd Foote as my assistant today. Todd has already been marked. The first nerve we'll be talking about today is the radial nerve. The radial nerve comes through the forearm, branches through the wrist, and into the web of the hand. The radial nerve branches off behind this portion of the hand behind the index finger. We will be attacking that nerve today with the tip, not the pad, but the tip of my middle finger up on a 45 degree angle. Also later in the tape, you will see us attacking the radial nerve and the ulnar nerve at the same time. I will be attacking those two nerves simultaneously with the sharpest part of my radial bone. Fist up. You'll be seeing a technique where I attack those nerves simultaneously. Those two nerves uh, will be easily located by just imagining that there's a wristwatch here and we'll just be attacking where someone wears a wristwatch. We'll also be attacking the superior cervical ganglion which is found here about an inch and a half below the ear and about an inch and a half below the hinge of the jaw. I'll be attacking that with my tibia bone while holding him down on the ground later on for control. We'll be attacking that directly straight in. That nerve again is directly below the sternocleidomastoid muscle, directly behind the hinge of the jaw. We'll be attacking the upper dorsal nerves. The upper dorsal nerves branch off the spine, just like a tree coming down on a 45 degree angle. Again, it'll be found between his spine and his shoulder blade. We'll be attacking those nerves with the tip of our elbow. Again, Todd, if you could just turn to the left. We'll also be attacking the communicans peroni nerve. The communicans peroni nerve runs between his hip down to the outside of his knee. It can be found almost directly below the seam of his pants. It's a very large target. If you just turn to the wall, please, Todd. We'll also be attacking the posterior tibial nerve found between the back of his knee down to his Achilles tendon, directly at the center of his calf, here. Before we talk about our quick controls today, I want to talk about some basic locks. I want to talk about the fine points of those basic locks. And I want to talk about what gives those locks the integrity that we need to control an extremely combative and pain tolerant subject. The first basic lock we're going to use today is just called the front wrist lock. We may have blanketed the elbow. We may have initially just seized the wrist by itself. Either way, we're going to pull the subject towards us, bring his elbow into my body, pressing between my upper arm, we're going to compress these two knuckles in a tight circle towards the inside of his wrist for compliance. Okay? Now, in order to prevent this subject from escaping, I have to elevate the wrist above the elbow. If I apply the front wrist lock here with the elbow at the same elevation as the wrist, if he's truly committed to escaping, he could pop up hitting me in the chin and he's gone. So the proper way to execute a front wrist lock is elbow down tight against the ribs, compressing the wrist, and down. Now let's talk about the front wrist lock and a common problem that arises when we try to, try to execute the, the front wrist lock. If we don't get into it fast enough, if we don't use tactical deception, and the subject senses that he's going to be locked, he may tighten his wrist really strong. 
If the subject is much stronger than me, like most people are, how am I going to bend his wrist? Hold on tight, Bruce, for me. <clears throat> With just my fingertips, I won't be able to do that. So we have a, a small trick that we're going to use here. All I'm going to do is take my four fingers. I'm just going to rake over his thumb. Bruce, try to hold on. Don't let it happen, OK? And I'm going to execute the front wrist lock, OK? Strong as you want. Again, strong as you want. It, it really doesn't matter. As you can see, Bruce is obviously a lot stronger than I am. It doesn't matter how strong he is, OK? It doesn't matter if his biceps are this big. Strong as he can, as strong as you want, strong as you want. We're here, and then we just shift down, and we're into the front wrist lock. OK, now we've talked about the front wrist lock. We've locked him in. He's between our ribs. The wrist is compressed. I have hand over hand, and he's in. Now, just this wrist lock alone, in its basic form, is enough to control most people. Oh, Bruce, try to shake that. OK, just the wrist itself. We've looked at how we can break it down if he becomes stubborn and strong. Make a fist boost for me. We just rake the thumb. Okay. Now we've achieved the front wrist lock. Now on the very rare occasion that we may deal with a subject who's extremely pain tolerant and the wrist lock isn't enough to gain compliance, we're going to need something else. And before we talked about the radial nerve, where it lies directly in the web of the hand behind this bone, directly behind the index finger. We're going to be attacking that with the tip of my middle finger. I'm going to be driving it into that radial nerve and up on a 45 degree angle, probably about the center of the hand is the direction that I'll be going in. So we've achieved the front wrist lock. I simply lay that finger against the radial nerve. I can even use the palm of my hand to compress the first knuckle of my finger to add to the penetration. And we're in. This is intensely painful, OK? And then this will get him to walk. OK, now. Now we need to go from the front wrist lock to the rear wrist lock so we can handcuff this subject. So again, right hand over right hand, left hand over my right hand. Maintain compression. Now this is dangerous. Anytime we transition from one lock to another, there's a possibility that we could lose control of the subject. So we have to do this right. So what we do is, at any time that we think he's going to try to escape, we can just buck the wrist. So we transfer with this hand, turning it over with his fingers towards his body. I'm maintaining compression. I slip my right hand over, grabbing the back of those knuckles. I drag and press my hand down to his elbow, pressing his elbow against my ribs, cupping his elbow, almost like a flagpole holder. I maintain compression. Anytime I have a problem, I can compress and induce pain. If he's struggling, that's what I want to do. I want to induce pain and then transition. OK, Bruce, just step back here for a second. Now, again, we maintain compression with four fingers against his wrist. Without looking, grab your handcuffs, take them out, isolate the single strand of the cuffs, reach underneath your own hand over the top of his wrist. Take the handcuffs and bring the handcuffs to the single strand. While using three fingers, maintaining a wrist lock, now move a little bit to the side here. I want to take my baby finger. I want to drop my baby finger over the links. Now I have a rear wrist lock. I have the cuffs in position. The cuffs are away from his clothes so they don't get caught up. I use pain compliance to direct the subject to put his hand behind his back. I just reach over with a natural grip like a handshake and I drop his wrist into the cuffs. Now I take my left hand. I drag his baby finger for extra control. Compress his wrist. again. Dragging and pressing, maintain a rear wrist lock like so. Take the subject, and I escort him. Come back here. Come here. OK, let's take, it, take a look at the side curl counter. This is called the side curl counter. I try a standard blanketing of the elbow. My intent is to take the subject into a front wrist lock. Unfortunately, the subject resists with what we call the side curl. Has a tremendous amount of leverage. All he does, he takes his elbow and he brings it into his hip. It's something that you see a lot of street people do. And a lot of times, the officer will lose total control, allowing the subject to either escape or to turn on the officer. So what we do here 
is as he walks away, I blink at the elbow. I don't contest his power. Just pull me slowly, Todd. I let him draw me in. I come up with my shin, hitting the nerve on his leg, driving him down, separating his arm, following his power back, and achieve the front wrist lock. Up. Come back here. Come here. No. Get back here. Get up. Okay, again, I'm trying to achieve the front wrist lock. This time we move to a level just a little bit higher than we did with the side curl. This is called the pull away wrist lock. This time the subject's walking away and I was able to seize his wrist and the subject pulled away from me. Locking his wrist, making, get strong Bruce, and now I was unable to bend his wrist and draw him towards me. I couldn't get myself into his body where I needed to be for front wrist lock. So how do I do this with someone so strong? Again, we're going to attack the radial nerve and the ulnar nerve with the sharpest part of my radial bone. We're going to shock his wrist by attacking those nerves. At the same time, I'm going to use compression with this portion of my hand, bending his wrist so he's strong. I strike, just bend it for the camera, Bruce. I bend the wrist. Now we actually have what we call a reverse front wrist lock. At the same time that I bend that wrist, I follow through, wrapping around his back of his arm, compressing the back of his arm towards his wrist, applying a front wrist lock. Now with the compression of the wrist, I just drive him back, down. I drop the tip of my tibia bone on the nerves in his neck, draw into the front wrist lock using my body as a base. Maintain control of the subject first. Okay, buddy? Maintain the front wrist lock. I drive onto the nerve to keep him down to the ground if I have to. Again, using the tip of my middle finger, I attack the radial nerve in the web of the hand. So now I have two nerve attacks while he's on the ground. Stay there. While he's concentrating on the pain, I maintain the wrist lock. I can continue to apply the nerve attack. I just drive my hand under his armpit achieving a front wrist lock, directing the subject to stand up, back here, and back into the front wrist lock again. Get back here. Get up. Not arresting me, man. I didn't do anything. Okay, in this particular technique, the subject knows that I'm trying to arrest him. He won't even let me touch his elbow or his wrist. So this time he puts his hands up. He says, you're not going to arrest me. He pulls his hands away from me. I approach a subject. And what I do is, as soon as I make range, as soon as I'm within range, I need to attack this arm fast before he can attack me with that arm. Now, all the time that I'm attacking this arm, I'm stepping to the side and I'm going to pull him off balance in this direction. So I move in, I attack his wrist with a spiral action, passing it at the same time with a monkey grip driving up to the back of his arm while passing his arm down. I drag him off to the side, off balance, separating his arm, seizing his wrist, not contesting his power, but following it back into the front wrist lock. Not arresting me, man. I didn't do anything.
devastated. Now here we have a subject that's extremely combative. He's about to attack a subject. I don't want him to know that I'm coming up behind him because I don't want him to turn his anger on me. So I walk directly behind him so he can't see me. I walk up behind him. I want to achieve three things at the same time. I want to walk up behind him. I want to step deep underneath his hips. At the same time, I want to drive my right hand under his right armpit, achieving a half Nelson. At the same time, I want my left hand to go over his left arm, achieving what we call a bar arm, not an arm bar. It's up on a 45 degree angle, so he can't get his arm out. If I drop my hand down, he can pull his elbow out and escape. So again, I achieve the two locks together, and I wedge his back, arch his back. That's why we call this the wedge. Then I lift him and turn him away. Now, because I need to get the camera angle, I just want to do a short, a short one, Bruce, right here, just a little stroke. Just take him. OK, now, right here, I reach down. I'm pressing his left arm to my body, tight to my body. I reach down. I grab the back of his hand. I bend his wrist, and I turn it into a rear wrist lock. And Bruce, just step back for a second for the camera. I bring it up into a rear wrist lock. Achieve the rear wrist lock. Grab my cuffs. Isolate the single strand. Place the single strand over the top of his wrist. And I bring the handcuffs to the single strand. Then I separate the handcuffs with my small finger. Bruce just turns the saddle bit for the camera. And I grab the cuffs with that small finger. Now, the cuffs are pretty much stable. Biggest issue here is watching his clothes. Then with the wrist compression, I direct the subject to put his other hand behind his back. Put your other hand behind your back, sir. I reach over, grab a natural handshake, and I drop it in the cuffs. OK, again, reach the back of his hand. I'm going to drag his baby finger, hook it, maintain the pressure, and transport the suspect. Okay, here's a situation where we, we ended up in an ugly struggle because we were able to achieve a compliance technique and the subject is on the ground. Well, now that he's on the ground, we want to keep him on the ground. His hands are clasped together underneath his body and he's pinned him to the, to the ground and I've got to get his hands out from underneath that. It's a very difficult task. Uh, it usually takes two to four officers to do something like this. Um, pressure points um, around here, the ear, may or may not work depending upon how much he moves his head and tries to escape. So we want a target area that's very big. Uh, I also want a target area that's not very mobile. So the first thing I want to do is maintain his position on the ground so he doesn't get up and attack me. And I move in and I drop my shin over the small of his back, pressing his body to the ground. I lift my foot off the ground so all my weight is on his lower back. I extend my leg for balance, just dropping my foot flat flat on the ground. Now, I've got to be able to get my hands underneath his body to get his wrists. Very difficult to do that. So I have to break him up. I've got to, I've have to weaken his, his muscles in his upper back so I can effectively uh, break his concentration. I also have to make my hand as small as I can, pressing my fingers together like a spear. I'm going to give him verbal commands, give me your hands, give me your hands. And then I'm going to drive the tip of my elbow into those upper dorsal nerves at his back, just on the outside of his spine. And I'm going to break him down. I don't want to do this to him. And then as he, he, he arches his back because of the pain, I drive in and I grab his wrist, OK? Grab his wrist. It's an overhand grip. Let me see the grip. Let me see the grip. Reach the overhand grip of four fingers, and I achieve the grip. Once I've achieved that grip, I go right back to the nerves on the other side of the spine, driving in, give me your hands, pulling his arm up, driving him behind me, bring his, his elbow between my legs, and achieving a rear wrist lock. Okay? Now I use the rear wrist lock for pain compliance. I grab the handcuffs, put in the first handcuffs. Now, you want to take your time here. 
I take my baby finger and I grab the links as I maintain compression of the wrist lock with the other hand. I grab the wrist lock with three fingers. These three fingers are maintaining the wrist lock. I drive it in. I maintain compression. I have a strong base against my body. Then I use pain compliance to direct the other hand behind his back. Sir, put your other hand behind your back. I reach out with a natural grip, grab his hand, apply the second handcuff. Okay, here we have a subject where the upper dorsal nerve attack was not effective. Again, because he was extremely pain tolerant. So we have to change our strategy here. <sighs> For the time being, he's happy with defeating me. And we're in a strength contest. It's a strength contest that he's going to win and he knows it. So what I'm going to do is I want to convince him. I, want, I just want to be a little bit deceptive tactically, convince him to think that I want to join into the strength contest. So while I'm telling him to give me his hands and I'm pulling his arms that are much stronger than mine, I'm reaching down with my foot. If you look to my, behind me, and you'll see me setting up my foot for an attack. I'm going to attack the posterior tibial nerve behind his calf. So as I'm drawing in his arms, give me your hands, I suddenly reach back, grab his foot, and clamp it in between my leg. Put your hands behind your back. Okay. This is very painful. Now, I have weight, I have pain compliance, and I'm able to control the subject with one hand. I can use my radio, I can use my cap stun, and I can look around. I would suggest that if you go to the ground, you look at the people in the crowd, look at the bystanders. If he has, if he has friends, those people will be much less likely to strike you or kick you if you look into their eyes and they think you can identify them the next day. So, if I don't have the luxury of a second officer, what I have to do is, I have to get him in cuffs without losing control of the posterior tibial nerve attack. So what I want to do is, I want to give pain before I transition. And I say, bring your hands back further to your back, and I draw up. Now, maintaining, maintaining the lock, I reach out, I grab his hand, grab my cuffs, drop his cuff on, grab his other cuff, bring his hand in, drop it in. Relax, buddy. Step back, step back, step back, step back. I'm not going anywhere. Okay, relax. I didn't say you were under arrest. Are you okay? I just saw you punch him. I'm worried about your medical condition here. You just punched him right in the head. Your knuckles, are they okay? Yeah, I'm fine. How about your fingers? How about your thumb? Okay, let's take a look at the situation. I'm a detail officer. I just watched a fight in progress. I just watched this subject punch that subject in the head. The balancer has full control of his guy, he's big enough to control him, and it's not really an issue for me to be concerned about the bouncer. The bouncer is staying close to watch me. But now I have a subject that's much bigger than me, and I don't have the strength to control him immediately. So what I want to do is I want to walk up, and I want to grab the small of his, I want to grab his belt at the small of his back immediately to prevent him from charging forward at the other subject, grabbing right here. Another thing I want to do is I want to grab his right hand because most people are right-handed. I grab his right wrist. If you watch in the scenario, the subject told me that he wasn't going to jail. So I actually used tactical deception. I tried to convince him that I was not ready to take him to jail. Although I had already developed probable cause, I wanted to, I wanted to trick him into a wrist lock. I didn't want this to become a strength contest, a strength contest that I could have lost. So what I did was, I focused on his medical condition, trying to convince him that that was my number one concern. While, while he was in a very emotionally charged situation, focusing mainly on that subject, he allowed me to check his medical condition. So I did that. I told him, I want to check your hand. I want to see if you're OK. I talked to him about his knuckles. I drew him in. I asked if he hurt his fingers. 
He said that he didn't, and it's irrelevant what his response is. And then I checked his thumb, and I gripped it, just as if I was checking it for an injury. Now I want you to watch how the tricky transport wrist lock works. What I'm going to do is I'm going to attack the back of these two knuckles, and I'm going to drive it in a tight circle. What makes this wrist lock work is I use the basket, I use the, the inside of my wrist like a basket driving up into the knuckles, folding the hand. Now I need to drive the elbow straight up with all my weight so the lock has begun immediately upon contact. Not this, not a loose elbow and turn around because he'll be able to escape. So the real trick to making this technique work is immediately applying the lock here. See the action? And then driving straight up and then coming in for the wrist lock. Then I want to grab the back of his neck to protect myself from strikes and draw him away from the other subject. Okay, let's take a look at the finish one more time. At the end of the check of his hand, I had seized his wrist with a seizure grip and turned it. I grabbed his thumb, clutching the pad with all four fingers. Then I relaxed my wrist, creating the basket. I'm going to attack the back of his knuckles, making a tight circle with his hand driving his arm straight up. So I drive up, using my hand as a basket, drawing him in, bringing his elbow tight to my ribs and in between my arm and, and my ribs. Now I have a tight circle going from the back of his knuckles in this direction right here. At the same time, I'm using isometric tension with my arm and my chest muscles pinching his arm in. I want to keep his wrist elevated above his elbow, if I'm too low, I won't be able to prevent the pop-up. So again, I want to keep his wrist above his elbow. Using pain compliance, driving the back of his hand down with this action right here, gripping his fingers, holding him here. Grabbing the back of his neck, my thumb and the middle finger, pinching into the nerves, behind his neck, and transporting the subject. Sure, do you have identification with you tonight? Now I'm going to show you a very simple technique that we can use to protect ourselves against a sucker punch. This technique is designed with a few thoughts in mind. Number one, we want to keep in mind that we, are, as police officers, will be working in low light conditions, that 90% of the population is right handed, so the sucker punch will come from the right side. We also want to take in consideration that the police officer has very little training time for every one of his defensive techniques. I think this technique is extremely important for police officers. It is my opinion that this is a place where police officers in this country are most efficient, which is protecting themselves against the sucker punch. I'm going to show you a technique that is universally effective against the sucker punch from the right side. It will be irrelevant whether that punch comes at me in a straight line, whether it comes at me in an arc, or whether it comes at me over the top. I'm going to do, I'm going to do the exact same technique each and every time. I don't have to time his right hand. I don't have to recognize or read the path that it travels. I only have to do the exact same technique every single time. Also, this technique has the offensive counter built right into the reflexive movement. Another very important consideration is, obviously we work in the real world. The potential for us getting struck in a real fight is, is very high. I'm going to show you how to minimize the impact of the strike so we don't become incapacitated. We can count a punch, continue to function, and stop this threat. Again, this technique is very simple. We do it the same way every single time. I want you to watch my body from my feet all the way to the top of my shoulders and watch what I do here. We always want to approach an interview position. I simply 
draw up my left hand into what we call a half shell, covering my face and looking at him with my right eye. At the same time, if you notice my left heel, I draw it back and up, turning away my groin and setting up my right counter punch. So at the exact same time, I turn my body to the side, I draw my hand up, and I deceptively as possible hide my counter punch behind my left hand so he can't see the right hand. So I've actually loaded up as I've defended myself against the right hand. I've actually loaded up my right hand so I could spring back for a counter. Again, nice and slow. I turn, cover my face. I'm able to handle the impact. I'm still close to the subject. And I return with the right cross, dropping it down. Not throwing it, but dropping it for power. Using both hip rotation, rotating my right heel, and almost collapsing my right knee, using gravity to my advantage at the same time. Let's take a look exactly what this looks like from his perspective. He throws the right hand. He's completely offensive in mindset. Throw the punch, Steven. I block. I hide my right hand behind my left hand. Steven, can you see the right hand? Not at all. I'm loaded up. I've turned my body sideways, hiding my groin. I've picked up my foot. Now watch the right heel. Okay. Now let me explain the right hand, what makes the right hand powerful. We're not throwing a right hand. We're actually dropping a right hand. Try to imagine that the right hand is heavy, as if it was a shot put. And it was so heavy that we couldn't throw it, that we had to actually support it with our body and drop it. So I'm going to use hip rotation, which begins from picking up the right heel flowing up my body with my hips and my shoulder. And then, just as I'm about to deliver that right hand, I not only want to use hip rotation, but at the same time, I want to use another external force, which is gravity. So as I load up, I turn with rotation, and I almost collapse my right knee and drop with my weight for the right cross. Sure, do you have identification with you tonight? Okay, now let's take a close look at the singular components in this technique. Paul, if you could, please grab my shirt. Paul grabs my shirt. We immediately want to step in with our hands, we want to grab the back of his shirt, gripping it tight. The reason is, is because he might throw punches immediately after controlling my body. Just mock punches. And I can impede his punches, at least for the time being, until I can counter punch, minimizing the impact of any of those strikes if they happen to land. You can see my arms are directly in front of his biceps. If he didn't have a shirt, we would attack with our open hands like so. So he grabs a shirt. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use his balance for my first attack. As Paul begins to move me around, he sees my steps merely as my attempt to maintain my balance. He doesn't recognize the fact that I'm actually chambering my leg. I'm going to show you a single action kick rotating directly from the hip. As I reach back and set him up, I drive with all my power, hitting him with everything I have in the shin area, which is loaded with nerves. So as Paul pushes me around and we're looking eye to eye, I just blast, kicking him in the shin. Usually the shin kick will be effective enough to stop the attack. 
but we immediately follow up after the kick, driving our index finger and our middle finger directly into those vulnerable points on either side of his esophagus, straight into his spine. Driving him back, removing his hands. Returning to our less than lethal weapons. Okay, let's take a close look at the last portion of our counterattack, which is the finger stabs. We're actually going to attack him with all four fingers of each hand driving forward. We're going to be focusing mainly on using our index finger and our middle finger, using the tips just like spears driving directly into his throat towards his spine. Not using the pads, but instead using the sharpest part of our fingers, which is the tips, directly towards the back of his spine, just over the collarbone. So let me try to show you exactly where that is. I want to take all four fingers, again, focusing on mostly the index finger and the middle finger, driving and jetting straight back over the collarbones and directly towards his spine, straight in with everything we have, driving him back, releasing his hands. Then moving back and away, going to our less than lethal weapons. Sir, put your left hand on your head, palm up. Do you have any weapons I need to know about? No, sir. Nothing? Sir, put your other hand behind your back. Sir, I want you to place this hand on your head, okay? Do that. Yes, sir. So there's nothing I need to know about, nothing sharp? No, sir. What's this? <laughs> I can't tell you that. Do you know it's legal in the state? I thought it was legal everywhere, man. Sure. Made by God. Put your other hand on your back. I think you're drunk, too. Man, I look too tight. Okay, I'm making comfortable for you. Okay, this is called the finger drag frisk. I approach a subject, I immediately seize his right hand on my right hand. I'll do this very slow, step by step. I seize his right hand, I move his hand in a spiral action back to my left hand, seizing the blade of his left hand with three fingers. One, two, three. Hooking and dragging his baby finger for control. Hooking the baby finger is the key to control. I drag it back, I lift his arm up, I press his palm against my ribs, locking the elbow. I immediately search a small of his back because that's where most illegal weapons are kept. And then I complete my search. Now, I always go under his arm, directing the subject to put his other arm behind his back. Put your other arm behind your back, sir. I don't move until I hook and drag the baby finger and I secure my other three fingers on the blade of his hand. Now, I take one step. Sir, put this hand on the back of your head. I take one step between his legs. I pivot on the ball of my foot. At the same time, I place the back of my hand on the small of his back, controlling his body and I continue my search. If I decide to arrest the subject, again, I go underneath his arm, bending his arm, reaching up into a rear wrist lock, handcuffing the subject. Okay, the reason why I move him with a spiral action is because it's much more difficult for him to resist a circular movement than a linear movement. If I move him in a straight line, then it will become a strength contest and the stronger person will win. It causes confusion if I move in a circle. So I grab the blade of his hand. Now let me show you where the key to control is. The key to control is dragging the baby finger. Now what I'm doing actually, turn on here Bruce, just face the camera. I'm not bending the finger back. What I'm doing is I'm hooking and dragging the finger almost as if I want to place that knuckle, roll it over, over to this portion of his hand. Now watch what happens. Face me Bruce. If I move the finger in that direction, roll it over. Okay, so there's a tre tremendous amount of control just by hooking and dragging the finger over, not back, and not to the side, as if I want to put that knuckle and roll it over to that portion of his hand. Okay, so we go back. Now, watch how much control this has. Here's. If 
If I reach the back of his hand, achieve the lock, and drag the baby finger. Now Bruce tried to punch me with that hand. He can't. That's the beauty of this frisk. It's very simple, and it's universally effective, meaning it doesn't matter how big the subject is compared to the officer, or vice versa. If the subject does try to strike me, to slowly move for a strike, I buck it, move into the front wrist lock. Again, using our basic locks over and over again for simplicity. If the subject decides to go for a backhand, go slow with the backhand, backhand the other way, I move in, I stun him with a rear wrist lock. If you notice, I don't step in right away. He goes for the, rear, he goes for the backhand, go ahead for the backhand slow. I stun him with a rear wrist lock, I reach in, and then I go for the full wrist lock, grabbing his wrist. Okay. almost completed a, a safe tour of duty. We've effectively got another combative subject in handcuffs. And we want to get him into a cell without getting assaulted. This is a two officer technique. What I want to do is I want to get the subject in a cell, I want to get him into a position of disadvantage, and I want to get out of the cell with the aid of another officer. So I'm going to ask the subject if he wants to get unhandcuffed. Sir, do you want to have your cuffs off? Yes. If you do that and you behave, I'll get you bailed and booked out of here in an hour. Okay, I want you to do everything I say or I'm gonna leave the cuffs on you. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay, I want you to walk over to the cell wall. I want you to get down on your knees. I want you to put your chest against the wall. I want you to cross your feet for me, sir. Now what I do is I step my foot in between his legs. I maintain the rear wrist lock with his finger. The other officer takes off his handcuffs. After the other officer takes off his handcuffs, the other officer is gonna move over to my right side. I'm controlling the subject by dragging the baby finger and controlling the rear wrist lock. I have my foot in between his legs and I'm pressing in for a lock here. Can you shake that? No. Okay. Now, without the subject knowing it, I reach over, I grab the hand of the fellow officer. With no verbal commands. I hope you have enjoyed this video program. Taking a subject into custody is a very dangerous task and often the trigger for an assault on a police officer. There are over 60,000 assaults on police officers each year in the United States. The average age of an attacker is 21 years old. The average age of a cop killer is 29 years old. Approximately 70% of all violent crimes in America are committed by young males between the ages of 17 and 24 years old. The age gap between you and the people you confront on the street will grow wider and wider and pretty soon, you may find yourself in a life and death struggle with a subject who is half your age or twice your size. These fast action control techniques are just one of many systems designed to control combative subjects. Every police officer should adopt a control system and practice it often. After 16 years of policing, I still believe there is nothing more important to a street cop than a skilled pair of hands, and that's a fact. Again, I thank you and hope you have enjoyed this video program.